sure. And your microphone should be on. Thank you. This is like amateur day today. I'm really sorry. Yeah. Thank you. You know, it's, it's weird. James and I are normally doesn't start in a bookstore till like the middle of the month because everybody's recovering from Christmas and publishers don't do things. Our January started on January 6th and we have been non-stop, I know. And now it's going to die this week. But, but we haven't caught up. Are you, I'm not caught up either. Probably. They're not yet caught up. Right. Right. We're doing something exciting. All right. There we go. All right, does everybody have a microphone? Oh, Sarah. Oh, my goodness. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's like a Keystone Cox friend. We've been on the road for are a week these, now. So we're a little bit I just sit on these two yourself, I don't even know what those are. Okay. <laughs> I think they got moved there off the table. Okay. All right, who knows? I've lost that? total track of what's happening. <laughs> we, right. have, we have a little giveaway. So I have to squeeze my So, Karen, does you put your microphone behind you on the chair? I hope. No, I gave it to her. Oh, you have it. Oh, I have it. Who's up there? Over there, too. Great. Right. Okay. Oh, there he is, the hero of the hour. Yay! Uh, I didn't have anything to do with this. <laughs> what do you need? Um, Patrick got the key and everything, and um, you might tell people here, if anybody's here for that meeting, that oh they might want to go upstairs because there were some that just wandered up. So, is everybody here for the three W's and not for the historical novelists? This is like the airplane. Remember the woman that got on and went to San Francisco and she was supposed to be going to Charlotte? And I still got United. And I still wonder, how did they let her on the plane? <laughs> Seriously, or ask her at the same point. All right, so everybody is on this flight, correct? All right. Um, your exit doors are here and here. Exactly. And the disgruntled co-pilot has left. all locked. I'll tell you my book. Right. So let me just complete the airplane story. I have four kids to put their Right. So here's what happened. On our way back from Egypt, Dana and I had flawless flights from Phoenix to Frankfurt to Cairo and Cairo to Frankfurt to Los Angeles, and then American could not get its act together. They put us all on the plane, and the pilot kept saying, it's just a light problem. We're going to fix it. We're going to fly. An hour, an hour and 20 minutes later, Dana and I observed the two pilots stand up, put their coats on, oh, and pick up their police, oh. and walk towards the exit, and one of them grabs his microphone as he's going off, and he says, somebody will make an announcement. But, oh my God. but they didn't fix the light. Well, anyway, I won't bore you with the whole thing. Dana and I called Rob, who put us on Southwest, so we walked across LAX carrying our luggage, and got on the Southwest flight, which was late, and just as the door was closing, the two pilots from America got on the flight. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, they could get to Phoenix. involved. So all of this has been done sober. And if we had it to do over, I would certainly have bought wine. <laughs> what was coming. Um, anyway, Reese Bowen was with us. And a question she asked, which I think is a really great one, is how did you all come to write together? And how do you write together? Which is a really interesting question. Well, it's the classic story. Three authors walk into a bar. <laughs> and uh, it was actually at a conference. Uh, quite some years ago, it was actually the year, the summer that my first book came out, Overseas, uh, might yeah. be available for sale.
sale because remember she has four kids to put through college. <laughs> yes. um, and um, and it was so it was the first my first book. So you know, of course, first you know first first book you think it's going to sell a million copies and it's going to get made into a movie. Uh, and so I went. I went on my first very very short short book tour. And I had been told that you should go into the airport bookstore and sign all their books so they can't return them. <laughs> and, and so I did this. <laughs> she knows. I know, but this is what I was told, and you're very naive. It's, it's a, an urban legend. It's an urban legend, but I believed it. I believe. I, I believed it, so I went into the bookstore, and uh, they were like, oh, I think we may have a few copies of that or here somewhere. So, and they had five copies of Overseas, and in the time, it took me to sign those five copies, um, and it, this was the summer of 2012, uh, about 30 women and possibly uh, a few men as well, and they were probably sitting next to you on the airplane, by the way, uh, bought copies of... A little book you may have heard of. Fifty Shades of Grey. They've never heard of it. This is an intellectual group. They have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> Crisp. Anyway, it sold a lot of copies that yeah. summer. And onwards. this was very discouraging for me. Obviously, I needed a lot of commiseration, so we turned to this conference and went to the bar. And meanwhile, Karen and I were also commiserating because we just come back from our own individual book tours. At that point, we were veterans. We knew our books weren't going to sell a million copies. But no matter how many books you've sold and how many tours you've been on, nothing changes getting back to that hotel room after doing back-to-back -back events, and you put on the robe, and you're just so completely exhausted, and so you order comfort food. And then the room service guy comes, and he gives you this look, and he looks at you, and he looks at your tray, and he says, is all that for you? <laughs> So we were all having such a great time in this bar that I think we retired, we did, I'm not thinking. We retired to a table, um, we ordered how many bottles? Well I think we had a few cocktails already. Yeah, a few yeah. cocktails and then we, we, we went on to wine. It was a very nice Tuscan red. Two. Yes. <laughs> and um, <laughs> that's all I would to talk. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And, and we were having it's the fourth such W time. Wine, it's a good time. Such a good time. time. And we're all familiar with each other's books. Um, we and we were having, you know, really getting along. And we were thinking, my gosh, who would ever want to go on book tour alone? Wouldn't it be great if we could go on book tour together? And our publisher could pay for it. And, <laughs> and our bar bill, which was rapidly mounting. Oh my gosh. So I. You know, so we, ben, yeah, well, someone we came up with a bright idea of, oh my god, this is easy. There's an easy way to get our publisher to pay for our girls' trip. We just have to write a book together. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, easy, easy peasy. Easy. And of course, I happen to have the most brilliant idea. Uh, because of course, we, as so we especially around here, we know Scotland sells really well, mm -hmm. uh, as, and as Barbara knows. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, and, and then we thought, like, well, what, what, we've got it. We'll write an anthology. Fifty Shades of Plaid. But <laughs> <laughs> not, they don't understand the reference. <laughs> <laughs> So we go rolling out of the bar into the hallway, and who should be there but Karen's editor. Who doesn't drink. Yeah. So she was stone cold sober. And we roll up to her and go, we've had the best idea ever. This is going to be a major bestseller. You'll want to sign us up right now. Fifty Shades of Plaid. She did not laugh. Yeah. Her eyes glazed over. Her eyes got a cold look. Yeah. <coughs> no, no, okay. You do it so much okay. better. Okay. Well, anyway, there's a special voice that editors use for authors. It's like a kindergartner teacher voice. And so she looks at us and she goes, okay, why don't you all go upstairs, have a big glass of water, take a few aspirin, you'll feel better in the morning. <laughs> we're like, but wait, don't you want to sign us up right now? This is the best idea ever. She's like, have those aspirin. <laughs> uh, so we took her advice, although it wasn't in the morning that we thought we felt better. It was more towards the evening. Um, and uh, happily, we had sort of jettisoned the Scotland idea, but we hadn't forgotten the wonderful idea that we had had, the wonderful and unexpected mm -hmm. idea of collaborating. We'd never collaborated before. We all had our own successful writing careers. There was well, really no... Some more successful than others at that point. But, <laughs> uh, there was no real reason besides getting our publisher to pay for a girl's trip and our bar bill for and us. that was a big reason. Right, <laughs> yes. Um, but it, and it was so funny because the three of us all write similar sort of time slip um, um, 
uh, stories, you know, where the, the past informs the present and you go back and forth. And, and we love that. And we love that about each other's books. And that's how we write. And, um, and I had sort of been playing with an idea in my, my head about three unrelated women living in the same building. I didn't have a, a setting or time reference or whatever, but I thought, you know, somehow they're related to the single building. And then Beatrice said... Well, as it happened, when you sort of said big building, you know, and then she mentioned New York, and I thought, well, as it so happens, uh, there is a building that my husband's family used to own a very long time ago. A very long time ago. <laughs> uh, and uh, it was on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, this gorgeous double-fronted mansion. Mm -hmm. uh, they had built it for... It cost about a million dollars to build back in 1914, which... Uh, in 1914 dollars, so you have an idea... But go on. Um, go well, on. they okay. Well, I mean, how much the did they patriarch sell it for later? died, so they did have to sell it uh, in the 1940s for how much? About $8? we don't like to talk about this in the family. It was about fifty thousand dollars, I think. Uh, so real estate not always a great thing. Oh, but it was. Oh, it hold on, oh, guys. Eventually, yeah. Ask her how much it sold for two years ago. Oh my We God. don't like to talk about this either. But it was something <laughs> in the region of a few million, maybe twenty-one million dollars yeah. unrenovated. Uh, oh, right so, right. exactly. So, uh, so, anyway. I would have paid for four kids. In yeah. I know. I would not be begging you to buy my books. Well, Beatrice <laughs> wouldn't be writing with us. She'd be swimming in her money like screwed. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so uh, we thought, well, why don't we write a novel? Three different women, three different generations of women, all connected by some central mystery that occurs in a house inspired by this gorgeous mansion on the Upper East Side. So we met. Uh, um, we were so out. excited about this idea that Karen made the ultimate sacrifice. Well, because Lauren was pregnant, right? she's always she was not pregnant. She was always pregnant, just pregnant, <laughs> finished being pregnant, or close to being pregnant. She's very fertile. She's <laughs> fertile mind. <laughs> Uh, okay, but anyway, so the thing, you're, meanwhile, the thing you should know about Karen, so oh, apparently I'm always pregnant, wine. but Karen sorry. is always cold. So oh. Karen, Karen does not like coming up north, particularly at cold times of year. But like when it's below 70. Yeah, so yeah. That, it was March 28th. I remember the day because it's my birthday. It was 68 degrees. Put on your calendars yes. and your presents. So you know, Beatrice and I met over at Alice's Teacup, which is this cute little tea shop on the Upper East Side, and we order a pot of tea, and we're like, where's Karen? We knew her plane had landed. We had tracked her. And then suddenly the door, like, flies open, and this cold gust comes through like a dementor. <laughs> and there's and this creature. <laughs> I mean, we're like, is it a bear? The servers are all, like, standing there, like, what is that? And it, and it starts to unwrap itself, and Karen's head emerges just with like icicles dripping from oh her eyelashes. It's Karen. And of course, everybody in New York is like, oh, it's really warm weather today. Yeah. Uh -huh. They're, they're laying, out, lying out naked in Central Park and I'm bundled in <laughs> Yeah. Antarctic anyway, I think Karen forgave us once we sat down. Well, well, first we gave her a giant plate of scones and clotted cream, and that helped mm -hmm. mollify her. Very hot tea. We Very wrapped our hands tea. around the bowls. Lots and lots of tea. But anyway, we sat there, and none of us, as Karen said, none of us had ever worked with anyone before. We were used to being in complete charge of our own fictional worlds, and we had More no idea if we could, well, mostly, <laughs> yeah. yeah, when the characters listen. Sometimes. But so what happened was we started throwing out ideas, and any time one of us did that, the others would pick up and run with it and we just kept ordering more tea and more scones more and more tea. jam and the poor servers yeah. were standing there like will they ask for the check maybe this time we'd be like more hot water <laughs> and they started like call the plumber but that, uh, but that's when i think we realized the whole reason why we were doing this and i don't know if we were just geniuses for <laughs> knowing that this would happen but when we started collaborating it was very clear to the three of us that we were, we were entering this all on the same level. We checked any ego at the door. We knew that this was a collaboration. This wasn't my book or her book. This was our <coughs> book. These are our characters and our plot. And it was such a magical experience. That's when the Unibrain was born. Yes. Uh, that's, and what is the Unibrain here? Okay, I gotta work on this. <coughs> it's one brain and three bodies. Yay! Sometimes she forgets and it's Stop it! So I got first put two brains in one body. Which is just a little, yeah. We're just three brains in one body. <laughs> so anyway, you need brain. Like yeah. Okay. Stop it. Less stop it. But anyway. so, but that was when we realized that this was such a magical thing. 
one person would say one thing and then we would just build and build and build and it was never um, uh, like, uh, it was never the other two critiquing the idea of the first one. It was just like, oh yeah. It was very horizontal, it, it was very yeah. collaborative. Very, yes. And, and like the magical. And the three of us do not actually do much plotting, I think, and outlining in our standalone Wait, we need plans. a plot? <laughs> we need their plot. <laughs> and a predetermined idea of what the book is about, in fact. And, and, and so when we sat down on this though, we were actually, and we, I don't know if we intended to or not, but we started plotting it out, like chapter by chapter, so that even though the idea was that each one of us would take one of these generations, one of these viewpoint characters, and develop that, uh, we created the whole plot and the characters together so that when we sat down to write, after creating this outline, and we wrote Round Robin, and may, I can't remember whose character came may say, I started and I would write my chapter and then said it to Lauren for her chapter, then Karen would get it, she would read what we'd written and then write hers, come back to me. So that round because robin. Because we different parts of the country, so yes. it was all by, by email. Well, the funny thing is we never sat we down never and heard thought it out scientifically. We never said, okay, this is how, why this will work this way. We just sort of stumbled into doing it this way, and somehow it worked for us. Yes. And the next thing we knew, we had it. oh, but we forgot to mention. So we went to get back to Karen's editor. And we said, so we're writing this book together. And she immediately, of course, was horrified. And was like, oh my god, not that plaid thing. Yeah. <laughs> really, 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 really. This is like, this is serious. And then she got really white. And she was like, not an anthology. <laughs> well, she's she, not she, an anthology. Because yeah. she was like, so it's an anthology. And we're like, no, it's a novel. And she's like, but there are three of you. And we said, no, really, it's a novel. But they love Karen over at Penguin. And they want to keep Karen happy. And so other than sending space heaters, the thing that was going to keep her happy at that point was, yeah, and why, was to buy this book. So they bought the book, but you could tell she did not think it would be any good. So then we sent that book off to Cindy. And do you want to tell it? You tell it Well, so I mean, it was, she really, it was kind of actually an air of almost insulting surprise. And she said, you know, this is actually really good. <laughs> and we're like, of course it's good. And then, and then this was actually even better. She sent the wrong editorial notes to the wrong author. She could not tell who had written which part. And the thing is, we've all written, we had all written lots of books by that point. We all have really strong and really, I, you know, unique voices. And we thought it would be blindingly obvious from the first paragraph of each chapter who had claimed which character. And she couldn't tell. And we thought maybe, okay, maybe she was uncaffeinated that day as well as on booze. I don't think she drinks ca caffeine. My God, how I does this one survive? <laughs> but anyway, so we thought, okay, maybe it was just a fluke. But then the book went out in the world. And we all started getting emails from our own individual readers saying, oh my God, I know which character you wrote. It's blah, blah, blah. And we'd be like, no, that wasn't me. And we realized we'd done something strange and wonderful. Mm -hmm. We created something that wasn't any of our own voices. It was a Team W voice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which was uh, very surprising. Even my daughter couldn't tell, and I wouldn't tell her either. Uh -huh. But the whole point of it, and, and what was so lovely, we had anticipated you know, doing some kind of a contest and people guessing in the big reveal. And then as it, it went on, and we realized how nobody could tell who it was. And then the wonderful reviews that we would get in, um, not just from readers, but also from <coughs> reviewers, how seamless it was, how it read like it was a single novel written by a single author. And that's when we thought, you know, that's how, that is the intention, and we really don't want readers to read it trying to figure out who wrote what part and to try to recognize. So we've decided that that is some, a secret we will take to our graves. Unless I we mean, auction it off to pay for Beatrice's kids' college. Uh, <laughs> 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 we may have to do the second one starts. Uh, but, you know, it's, we, uh, you know, I, I think once you kind of get away from that, not, not that we don't, you know, have fun with knowing that you're trying to guess. <laughs> we like to mess with you. So you might think that a southern character must be written by Karen, but then you might think to yourself, well, they're going to know that I'm going to think it's Karen, so it's going to not be Karen. But then, you know, what if we know that you're going to think it's not Karen, so that it actually <laughs> is Karen? <laughs> it's like that scene of Princess Bride with the boy child. child. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, so we kind of mess around with you. We like to have fun knowing that you're guessing. But, you know, to us, it doesn't matter. We hope that you read it as a single novel. That's how it's intended. Uh, that's how it reads. We hope that within the first few chapters, you've, you're just so immersed in this fictional world that you're no longer saying, oh, is that Beatrice? Is that Karen? Is that Lauren? And um, I have to say, with it, you know, and then we moved to Beatrice's longtime editor, who's also now my editor, and she has <laughs> also consistently sent us the wrong edits. 
And we're terribly proud that with every book, people guess more and more wrong about <laughs> for, for some very creative reasons. And it's interesting, they're always thinking it's something we've hidden in the chapter. Uh, my husband actually is the one person instantly knows who wrote what because, and I don't tell him, uh, he just knows our voices so well. And that's the thing, yeah. it's the voices. You can still hear little echoes of our, uh, of our single title voices in the voices of our characters. Although my favorite conspiracy theory, and this is I guess because <laughs> the books are so seamless, is that, so we got an email from a reader saying, it's okay, you can tell us the truth, we know. <laughs> Beatrice really writes the whole thing, right? Oh. And you, Harry, just provide expertise. Oh. Right. <laughs> We're still trying to figure out what kind of expertise we Because we know that I really write the Expertise. Yeah. By expertise, you mean wine. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually not a conspiracy. She just sits here at the computer. We just pour wine into her glass. So we've come back to wine. The amazing part is they did all that on three cappuccinos. <laughs> wow. Well, that was such was a successful question. <laughs> Sorry, I have just one more away. question. Oh, yeah. Right, which is, and I think it's a really interesting one. You said that each of you tends to write the same structure in the book, i.e. time slip, which is a vocabulary that has developed over the last 20 years. Used to be there was only time travel, right. and that was, you know, science fiction-y thing. When Outlander published, nobody knew what to call it or what it was. Um, and that turns out to be time slip. But then there's also time jump, where you can have a different category, where you can have one story in the present and one in the past, and they go back and forth. So they're all slightly different. But my question is, what attracted each of you, before you started writing as a team, to that story structure? Because I know I've been with Lauren since the beginning for the Pink Carnation, all of her books involved mm -hmm. time jump, really, not time mm -hmm. slip. Yeah, right? for the first Pink book back, which I started writing in 2003, so I was sort of way at the front edge of time yes. jump. Right. And for me, it was I am fascinated by the way the past informs the present, sometimes without our even realizing it, that something could have happened to our great-grandparents, and the reverberations of that are felt down through the generations but often the family stories we receive are, it's like a game of telephone. We don't know what really happened, but the way those stories are constructed and the things that aren't told are often the things that shape our grandparents and our parents and us the most. And so what I'm so interested in is unpeeling those layers, figuring out what's gotten us to where we are. What's our thing? How does what we believe about our families and the past affect how we see ourselves? And if some of those untruths are stripped away, then what's left of us? What, how do we see ourselves then? And I want to follow that because it was very interesting that you should mention the Incarnation series. So my very first published novel was a time travel set in Civil War Georgia where a modern day woman goes back to Civil War Georgia and then back and forth. So, um, and because I grew up loving time travel, time at the top, I don't know if anybody read that, that's old, old book out of print. Um, but every time travel book as a child I could get a hold of. Daphne du Maurier uh, did time travel, right? I did, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Daphne du Maurier? Oh, I'll have to find I it. Love it's it's one. It's, it's, he goes back to the medieval time, uh, medieval court. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, there were so many, so many gems out there, and, and I was yeah. obsessed, and that's one of the reasons why I picked up Outlander the first time. Mm -hmm. Um, and so my first book was a time travel, and when I moved, that was with a different publisher, and when I moved to Penguin, I told my editor I want to write another time travel. She says, Karen, unless you're dying to get well done, nobody's buying time travel. <laughs> and so I had just finished reading The Pink Carnation, and I thought, okay, well, if I can't do time travel, <laughs> I'm going to do time jump. And, mm -hmm. and that worked marvelously. That was my first time uh, jump book, which was On Folly Beach. Wow. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I mean, I think the other thing is that the three of us being, you know, you know, even though you know, Karen claims she never wanted to be a writer until she sat down and started writing her first book, oh, but, but the three of us that we do have in common is that we have a passion for history. And I think if you are somebody who is a history native, uh, somebody who's been in the history game, you know, then there's a lot of writers who are now writing historical fiction. Uh, you know, we are history natives, and, and that nerds. means We're really that nerd. nerds. Mm -hmm. yes. we, I like to say history natives because that sounds less, you know, nerdy pejorative. <laughs> but, <laughs> exactly. but I mean, it's like you literally feel history living and breathing around you, and sometimes time feels like a very fragile thing. Yes. Like, you know, if you can almost close your eyes and the past is right mm -hmm. back yeah. there, and these people are living and breathing, and then there is this 
past that still exists within the present. And I think that's what we're trying to communicate with this mm -hmm. narrative structure, uh, is that, you know, that immediacy. Oh, immediacy. May, I, may I go off yeah. on a slightly side rant? There was this very annoying article in the New York Times a few months ago about, or maybe it was last year, about why is historical fiction relevant? And it was you know, about how all these literary writers thought historical fiction was a lesser art because what does historical fiction matter anyway? The past is past. And it was an article that was actually trying to defend historical fiction as a literary genre, but I found it so incredibly condescending because the idea was we had to dig to find out why should historical fiction matter to us today? And like Beatrice was saying, it's all around us. It's in the, the very steps that we walk. Someone came here. Someone came here and decided to make a town, and their actions have impacted the lives of everyone. And not only that, here. but just ideas. Mm -hmm. you know, there's no, there's no original idea. You know, yeah. You know, in the '60s, they thought they invented the sexual revolution. No, no, no. Yeah, you know, that goes way oh, back. Actually, that's what my favorite Nancy Mitford quotes were. Apparently, in her old age, in the 1960s, where everyone was being all wild, she's like, "Huh? You can't, you know, hold a candle to what we did in the 1920s." <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so. So let me add, too, that in virtually any mystery, there really is time jump, because to find the motive mm -hmm. and figure out why the crime occurred, mm -hmm. you always have to go back okay. into the lives of the, the victim, but also the circle of suspects, mm -hmm. or whatever it might be, in order to work out why. I just finished reading the new Ian Rutledge, the Carol uh, Todd, no, uh, Charles love. Todd book, yeah, yeah. February 6th, everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and in order to figure out you know, what happened, you have to go back and explore the past, what happened to these characters. And also, really, historical fiction and crime fiction are not that different. Mm -hmm. um, yes. You're just immersing yourself. Well, it's also, it's the law of unintended consequences in both. Right. Because when you read a crime novel and you're looking at how these events unfolded, often it's a minutiae of daily life. Things people thought would be unimportant, but then they made one choice that leads to another yep. choice, and suddenly you've got a dead body in the library with a candlestick next to it. That's really true. Very <laughs> often, very often, you know, the, the motive turns out to, to have been, in fact, a series of choices that led to a <laughs> terrible <laughs> result, not just one. Si it wouldn't be that interesting, you know, if a spouse just picks up a frying pan and goes whack. You know, well, well, that's, a, that's a two-page story, you know, it really isn't that. Yeah. Intriguing. All right, so my last question for all of you is, did you actually force yourself to do research at the Paris Ritz in order to write this book? This is a very oh, sad story. Oh, 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 we actually did the original idea, because when we finished The Forgotten Room, we loved this idea of building a book around a house, because who doesn't love a good girl meets house story. Uh, it's the greatest romance of all. Really. And, um, and so we thought, well, instead of like New York City, we could go somewhere really fun for research, like, for example, Paris. Paris. And why not the Ritz, if you're going to be yeah. in Paris? Yeah. Karen speaks fluent, fluent Franglais. Mm -hmm. You should hear her. Oh, it is very She can yeah. speak like this. They can very well. And it would have been a tax deductible. <laughs> they to Paris. I mean, what the answer is? Question. We're so, getting there. So, so we have these plans, and we're, we're going to make all of the inevitable. And and our husbands, unfortunately, uh, husbands we offered to get them babysitters, people. and even for the kids too. <laughs> um, but uh, but they said, no. you know, I mean, I mean you know, I had like a six month old at the time. <laughs> So. If you can take care of a six month old, <laughs> surely, surely your husband can. That's a whole other story. And survive. How did you all create well, the roots? Luckily, we had all been to Paris many times yeah, ourselves individually before we had children. But never but stayed at the Ritz. Never stayed at the Ritz. But I mean, yeah. it is iconic. There yeah. is so much information out there. And, you know, and we had, I had been outside. There's so many stories around. I think if you know mm -hmm. Paris and you have a sense for the atmosphere of Paris, and then you have all this information about the Ritz that's that's available, all these books, and mm -hmm. of course the internet. Uh, we I think we are able to reconstruct yes. fairly accurately uh, what is going on in the Ritz. In uh, and we haven't really <laughs> talked about the book itself, but yes. uh, it takes place three different ge generations of women: World War One, World War Two, and the 1960s. So three different eras for the Ritz, and how it changes with each one, and yet still manages to be very much at the center mm -hmm. of uh, of life there in Paris. 
Yes, and those are all very well documented time periods. So we were sort of wallowing in all sorts of first hand accounts of pictures. So we really felt like we were there, not there now, which can be misleading because yeah. sometimes when you go to True. research And they just did a big renovation as well. Exactly, so which is annoying because sometimes you can anything. slip up actually not writing the places you haven't been, but writing the places you have because things change over time. And so things that you think would have been there forever are not actually, we were just discussing historical howlers with Reese Bowen over lunch. And oh, one of my favorite historical howlers was in a novel by an English woman, it's set in 16th century London, where she talks about navigating by the dome of St. Paul's. Well, the old St. Paul's didn't have a dome. That wasn't <laughs> yeah. built till a century later. But you know, she lived in London and she you know, spent her life in the shadow of the dome. But you have to put yourself in the mindset of the time period you're writing about. So sometimes having been someplace or lived someplace can actually be misleading because the details that you take almost as muscle memory were not there in the earlier time period. And so you really have to try to clear everything you know personally from your head and rely on the accounts of the people who were there at the time, what they saw and experienced and used. And the verse is so iconic. There are many, many books about it. Many, some of you might have read Melanie Benjamin's Mistress of the Ritz which I thought was an interesting book. And, and luxury hotels work more or less the same way. Mm -hmm. They're like nations unto themselves. Yeah, you could be Claridge's, you could be the Ritz, mm -hmm. and it's not dramatically different. But I lied when I said it was my last question. I do have one more <laughs> that, that I think. Is it possible to write a story that is set partly in World War One and partly in World War II that is not tragic? Uh, <laughs> oh God, that's such a tough question. It really is. Yeah. Well, well, I, well, I think that's that, I why we ended up with having this 1960s. I think that, you know, when you're in these periods, you're so, uh, you know, we sort of forget. It's so easy for us to look back and imagine everything was a foregone conclusion. And when you're in those, you're just day to day. Yeah. You're truly day to day mm -hmm. trying to survive. But I think that's also, our, this book in particular illustrates what we were talking about, you know, how history is always relevant, how the past is never the past, because in our book, what happens in World War One and World War Two, and yes, there are tragic circumstances, but if that those things had not happened, we wouldn't have the '60s yes. part and with cute clothes. Yeah, mm -hmm. all the cute clothes. You know, which which is a whole different sort of tone than the other parts because it is uplifting. It is sort of the conclusion that never would have happened if it hadn't been for those two past periods. And I think even within the darker bits, I think part of what draws people right now to World War I and World War II narratives is that you can see that even in the darkest of times, people, ordinary people, find what they have in themselves. They learn to be resilient and to rise above their circumstances. So it's like, did anyone see the movie back when, How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days? Mm -hmm. <laughs> My yes. this is relevant. And you know, there's that bit where she wants to write articles, of, you know, there's that one woman there in their editorial meeting, and she's like, and then I wrote about people dying from nail fungus, but strangely, a bee. And everything ends with, it's this horrible thing, and then she's like, but strangely, a bee. So I feel like our World War One and World War II sections, although we, we drew from the narrative, and oh my god, the details you find about those periods are incredible and crazy and dark, <coughs> but it's still, strangely, upbeat. Yeah. Because it's well, also a survival. Refer. To me, yes. ultimately, I think and people love. rise within circumstances, yeah. and what keeps you going through these things is hope. Otherwise, why are you even bothering to survive yes. if there is not some hope? Hope and kindness. The kindness yes. of people in difficult times people who risk their lives to help others when it would be easier for them not to. I think that's incredibly uplifting and really transcends the evil you see and the darker circumstances. Well, this is a book about betrayals in large part, um, which is why I asked the story. And you, this is just my take, and I don't mean this as a spoiler, and you all will have to decide, but see, I think, I think the 1960s betrayal was the most unforgivable. Yep, Ooh. I hated it. Um, yeah. Ooh. I, mean, Ooh. I, don't mean, I don't mean I hated the story. I don't mean that, but I, I really hated it. What happens? Um, and you'll have to decide for yourself because each of these stories has a major betrayal that profoundly affects people's lives, and you will have to decide which one of them you you know you judge, if you will, because it's kind of hard not to when we're talking about betrayal, but I was going to throw that one at you, because wow. I think that, that was a surprise, right? Well, yeah, I mean, well, we've actually gotten a couple of emails to that fact, and it's fascinating to me how in every book, of course, one character will speak to people more than another, but I feel like we've had 
really very little commonality among responses so far. That people hate and love very different characters. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's not the character. It's it's, it's, yeah. it's the betrayal. No, I get yeah. that. Yeah. And uh, to be honest, of all the emails that I've gotten so far of about this book, um, and any bones <coughs> things they love or any bones they want to pick, and they've actually been very positive. Yeah. Not one person has has condemned. That action. Wow. That action. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you all get to go home and read this and decide for yourself. What page? You know. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that that is actually a character who reads the end of the book first. Talk to me. I'm going to tear off that last chapter. <laughs> <laughs> and then when you're done reading it, Barbara will give you the How rest. Really <laughs> yeah, really. Right, but you know what? That, I mean, part of the point of reading a book and coming down here is we shouldn't all agree. Absolutely. We should yeah. not. Yeah. Every one of us, you know, it's like if, if we have wine, some of you I are know. coming back to wine. Each it fourth is w. the fourth W. It is. Yes. But I mean, you know, your palates are all different. And, you know, one of you is going to really like the wine, and another is going to say, eh. You know, whatever. And I think that's true with books. And it's really important that you have faith in your own judgment, your own take mm -hmm. on a book, you know? And just because it's a bestseller like Fifty Shades of Grey and you didn't like it doesn't mean there's no anything either. wrong with you. You know, you're fine. And I always say this to you, and I won't apply it to this book, life's too short to read bad books. Mm -hmm. If yes. you're reading a book and Indeed. it is not working for you, you should put it aside yeah. and read another yeah. book. I know some people just can't do that. You know, it's like a commitment. You started the book, <laughs> you're just gonna go to the end, all right? And I have become more ruthless in my, you know, professional life, because I have to read professionally, and you are mostly reading for fun. But I do think it's important. So when you read the story, you have to decide for yourself, you know, what you think. About the characters and what they chose to do. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, questions from the audience? What? What? How long? Oh wait, there's a lady that actually is first. first. Don't forget Hi. these people. Uh, okay. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, say goodbye to Facebook. Oh, sorry. Oh, yes. Okay. I forgot about that. Oh, thank, thank you for joining us. Oh, this is wow. somewhat exciting oh. and completely unstructured. I hope this was my best. Oh. <laughs> 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 And no person or bottle of wine was harmed. <laughs>